We have a friend of the family here today, well, at least virtually, um, in these awkward times. Um, thanks for coming, Simon. So um, he's a, a theoretical slash mathematical physicist that, as, as we know, who's like interested in the mathematics of quantum computing in the in the broadest um, sense, and he claims to um, have had two further careers um, before he started his third career in quantum computing, uh, having worked in machine learning and uh, finance, working on algorithmic, um, algorithmic trading. So there's yep. lots of overlap with our work and with interests, um, and he's done beautiful work in, 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 in many directions, specifically in the context of quantum error correction. He's one of the few people who dare to think about Fibonacci onion codes and how to decode them. That's a pretty nasty business, but he has done serious steps in that direction. He has worked on quantum LGPC codes uh, recently with um, spectacular results, thinking about encoding circuits to optimally encode or close to optimal encode um, per codes using quantum circuits and also like more mathematically minded questions in quantum error correction involving phase of matter, category theory, and all that. And the talk today will be along these lines. So we will hear about categories, quantum error correction, and all that. So I think I'm not wasting any more time. Thanks for coming. And the stage is all yours. OK, so I'm going to do some writing over here. Can you focus on this, on my writing, whoever's oh. in charge? What do you start? Ah, there is a second. <laughs> a second. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Mm -hmm. Great. So is that working? Yeah, yeah. You can see it. Big and wide. <laughs> okay. So let's pin that. That's 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 cool. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh the last time I gave this talk, I did a bunch of slides and I just felt um, they looked good, but just I really, it was, it's much better when, when I write everything out, it's much more hands-on. So that's what I'm going to try today. And, okay, so where am I going to start here? Everyone can hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. All good. All right. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I um, there's going to be. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm really interested in this. Um, is using these ideas from category theory in for quantum codes, and I guess I'm just going to try to avoid talking about the abstract category theory as much as possible and just do examples. And that's really the only way I understand this stuff is by doing a lot of examples. I find the mathematics literature very difficult to understand. And actually most of this stuff I've learned from talking to mathematicians. So yeah, I'm gonna try to um, pass on some of this today. So let me, right, so, I, so one idea that I, I'm gonna to use to focus this talk is the idea of a graph in, in terms of uh, if you have a function, uh, uh, I guess normally you would write the axes as, an, as x and y, but I'm going to just write the axes axes here as a and b. And then if we uh, want to draw a function, that uh, the graph of the function, it, I guess it looks something like that. And mathematicians, they would say, well, a, a and b are sets, and then your function from a to b uh, hope we all know uh, how this works. And then you start thinking about all the possible functions from A to B. And then this is uh, the category theory notation that on A comma B, this is supposed to be the set of all functions from A to B. So I hope everyone is okay with this HOM. It's short for homomorphism and I guess uh, when you're thinking about A and B as groups, then this is supposed to be the, 
the set of all homomorphisms from the group A to the group B. And so this is the idea today is that I'm going to just take, take this picture and translate it to different worlds where A and B are not sets, maybe they're vector spaces. So let's, so let's just, I'm gonna to try to do columns here. So let me label this column. This is the category of sets. Uh, let me just, uh, what am I gonna do here? Okay, there's some more information coming. So let me, let me move over to the category of vector spaces. And I was thinking about this the other day and there's a kind of a weird analogy I'm having trouble drawing the straight lines today, but there's a kind of a weird analogy to graphs when you're thinking about vector spaces. And I think that you could think of a matrix as a kind of a graph of a linear function. So let me just draw this again. And I guess the, the axes are really being labeled by basis elements. So So it's a kind of a table that you get, I guess. And then, uh, right, so maybe there's what? What have I got here? So A has got five basis elements and B has got three basis elements. And then all of these boxes are just labeled with, with numbers, I guess, and so on. And I, and I guess, um, unlike, uh, unlike with graphs, you're allowed to have numbers on top of each other, because in, in vector spaces, one vector can go to the, the superposition of, of two vectors. Yeah. So is this all making sense so far? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thanks. OK. So let me write this down again. Home A to B. And there's a magic that happens that I guess we know we we know this very well that this this set I'm writing this as a set of linear maps from A to B because it's in this column here. This it's not just a set of linear maps; it actually becomes a vector space in itself. And you can you can write down this vector space. It's actually the dual of A. Tensor product B. And I'm very likely to make mistakes, so please stop me if I screw something up. Because that happens a lot. All right. <clears throat> so now the question is uh, as, a, as a category theorist, we're kind of wondering this how, why doesn't this equation work over in this column over here? Well, first of all, I guess we need to define what this A star is. So A star by definition is, it's just the linear maps from A to the underlying field. So I'm gonna just write K for the field. And so that, I guess that becomes part of my definition of, of the category. So it's the category of vector spaces over this field. Okay, and we also have this tensor product here. So I'm gonna write this tensor product. So that's now the label for my column. It's the category of vector spaces with tensor product over the, over the sum field K. And usually we think about complex numbers here. I'm also gonna just make these finite dimensional vector spaces to keep everything sensible. We don't have to worry about convergence or anything like that. And so there's an, there's an analogy over, over in this column that you just use the Cartesian product and the one element set, I'll just write that as one. It's supposed to be just a set with just one element. But what happens over here is if you try to make a dual object, try homing any set to the one element set, this is still just one. So you don't get anything from here. So you can't, 
you can't do this, this, this trick just breaks down in this column. Uh, sorry, I already don't understand where this one is coming from and what it means. The one, okay, so the one is, that's a good question, thanks. So the one, I guess why I put it in the decoration here is that the one is supposed to be the unit for this product. So whenever you take a set Cartesian product with a one element set, you just get back the original set. Ah, uh, I see. And let me write that a times one is always going to be okay great. and then yeah so the same thing happens over here a tensor the unit object which is just the underlying field always gives you a you get i see okay thank you yeah okay so there's enough i've that I've kind of left out a blank column here. So let me just tell you what's going to go in this blank column. This is a kind of, I don't know if it's halfway in between, but it's, it's kind of a halfway house between sets and vector spaces. It's a category of sets with relations. And this time we're going to have homes from a relation, homes from a set. We still have sets here, a set A to a set B. This time uh, a relation is just like, it's like a true false matrix. So the home A, B, this is this, the set of relations from A to B. And I just think of it as you just get to fill in some of these. And that's like true. So this is like uh, so are these can, uh, are these like groups, for example, or what, what is an example for these relations? A, A and B are just sets. And we're just filling, I mean, you could think of it as either false and true or uh, uh, this is false is acting like zero and true is acting like one. So but and, there is there is less structure than plugging in Z2 as your field on the left hand side, right? Exactly. Like, exactly. There's linearity or something. Yeah. yeah so okay. so yeah so no so, scalar as well yeah. yeah the scalars are false and true and then uh the, the, the sum is uh or and the product is and so really there's like a secret connection between these two columns and what's happening here is you're replacing your field which are much with a much weaker thing which is called a semi-ring It's the semi ring uh, over the truth values. And it turns out that much of the linear algebra still works up over a semi ring because you, you have distributivity. That's the, that's the key there. Okay, so let me, let me draw another column here. And this column is going to get really huge. So I'm going to have to go to another page. But this column is going to be created and, and and why semi ring i mean there's no no um yeah so additive inverse no, somehow right or yeah yeah there's no no negatives mm -hmm. yeah so once you get once you get to one there's no way to to once you get to true there's no way to add anything that will get you back to false yeah Another name for this is a rig. Uh, it's like you, you leave out the negatives. <laughs> and, and, and no negatives, right? No X <laughs> in the ring. It's <laughs> okay, so, okay, so graded vector spaces. So what, so I'm not gonna be able to fit much into this column, but let me try. So this time, uh, our, vec our objects are vector spaces. They're like, inter 
uh, integer indexed sequence of vector spaces. So each vector space has a, has a grade. So think of it like a sequence of vector spaces. So these are all coming from this column over here, each one here. Does it have to be integer at this point or does it uh, just, does it I guess just it happening to... that uh, to be that the integers cover also cases of degraded vector spaces? I mean, it has to be countable, I guess, no? Yeah, but this is yeah. the question. Yeah. Yeah. You, there are definitely way, there's plenty of variations here. Let's just stick with, let me, let me put it up here so we don't get yeah. lost. Integer graded vector spaces. You could definitely stick another abelian group here. I think that's what you're suggesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah basically, yeah. Yeah. So let me let me give an example straight away. So um, I guess there's also a field vector spaces over some field. So probably uh, the best example here is the vector spaces of polynomials. So there's, I guess, I'm, let me just use this notation. So I'm going to introduce a variable. So this is supposed to be polynomial -y, but it's, it's, uh, it's graded so a zero I guess is all the constant polynomials. How am I going to do this? Constant polynomials. A one is going to be like linear polynomials. A two is quadratic polynomials. And I and I guess these are all just one-dimensional vector spaces. But you could think of introducing another variable here, x and y, and then a1 would be two-dimensional, a2 would be three-dimensional, right? It would be a x y, a y squared. So these these are the homogeneous quadratic polynomials in two variables. Let me just take two variables. All right, so this column I already ran out of room, so let's keep going. And all right, so two, a one, a zero, and I guess a minus one, there are these are all empty. So that's so we don't need to worry about that. And I'm going to I want to think about homes from some graded vector space to some other graded vector space. So let me just take the same one for now. And what this is, is going to be just a map for each grade. We're going to, we're going to have a map. And Right, so I want to, so actually, I want to do a bit better because I want this to also be a graded vector space. So remember over here, we had our homes ended up being a vector space, which I could write down it's explicitly what it was. I want to do the same thing over here with graded. So I want to think about not just maps between the same grade, but there are other guys which, which uh, let me try different colors here. So, so the maps that go up, up one or down one, those should also be inside this graded vector space. So the idea is to sort of have equivalent classes of um, homomorphisms that within one class you have sort of you have a, a clear way how the 
grade is changed. Um, like if I apply it to an, like a sort of minus one labeled homomorphism, always sends a K labeled element to a K minus one labeled element. Yeah. Whereas a general homomorphism could do anything to a, to a, um, uh, to a, but I, don't think that, but I don't think there is any kind of restriction. I think what he's saying is that you can get from any graded cell to any other graded cell at the moment when you map from home A to home A. Okay, so okay, no, this is this is it. This is um so I guess we're asking is no. do we include non-homogeneous guys in our definition of graded vector space? And I think I'm gonna say no. So we're not uh this. Right, so maybe this is bad notation here, but I actually want to think of. I mean, it's it's up to you, but let's just let's just think of di direct sum of these yeah, homogeneous yeah, grades. Yeah. So we're not allowed to take a linear guy plus a constant guy. Yeah, yeah, and then so what you're indicating with these arrows pointing in different directions is that this uh, direct sum of a carries over to make hom aa also a direct sum yeah so let's write this down so yes i see mm -hmm. so i guess the hom the grade i yep. component of this graded vector space is going to be a direct sum of vector space homes from j to j plus i And the reason why I brought up this polynomial algebra <laughs> is because there's a really cool example that I was just thinking about yesterday. I, uh, it's got a lot of names, but one name is the while algebra. And this is, this is, uh, these are the position and momentum operators from, I guess, like Schrodinger quantum mechanics. So I guess we have partial differentiation by X and multiplication by X. And this guy has grade minus one. So it sends quadratics to linears, to linears to constants. And this guy has grade plus one. So yeah, so that's in home minus one, and that's in home plus one. Is it always the case that the field is home zero? Oh, that's a great example. That's a great question. Okay, so yeah, so what we really need here is what we haven't talked about yet is the tensor product and also what is the unit. So yeah, so let's try the unit here. And I, th I think you said the right thing, which is the unit, the unit is just, uh, it's just the, the field in grade zero. I don't know how to, how to write this, something like that. And so, yeah, so now we can write, the, we can write dual rise home from A to I is going to just look like, oops, A2, zero, and minus one. We just have a field in grade zero and then zeros everywhere else. And you can see what's happening here is it's actually re reversing the grade. So in grade zero, we just get the dual of this vector space in grade zero. On grade one, we get the dual of this guy. So so this guy at grade i, yeah, I guess I guess I just reuse this equation here. How is this going to work?
So J has to be minus I here. Like where's the, sorry, where's the vial algebra coming from? I mean, this is like the, this um, oh. ring. Differential operators. Is it just an example? Or, or, or Sorry, what? that was the end of the example. Yeah, okay. so I'm going. I'm going back to the general theory of graded. Okay, I see. Vector spaces here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm, I'm taking some graded vector space A, and I'm just homing it to the to the unit object, which is this guy, and I'm using different colors here, but. The only non-zero homes. So the only, this kind of reverses the grading. That's, that's, kind of, that's what I'm saying here. So, so what this is saying is that the dual, you take the dual, the dual guy at grade I, you end up with the guy at grade minus I dual with him. That's a vector space, that's a grading. Space. So duality just flips the gradient. Yeah, this is this is uh... yep. okay. Just so with minus yeah. i, with minus i, um, I mean you are implicitly using that the grading is the um, um, group of integers, right? So yep. is it true that in general there is sort of the inverse element of the grade? from the because grading is I a guess that, yeah I think that should work so in general uh, right so in general where's, where is that? this yeah so this formula for the whole the grade i we're just using plus here so if our but grading was group some other group we would uh, just yeah, use yeah. some of the other group operation here yeah that's right cool. and the tensor product I should write down what the tensor product is at grade i. So the tensor product is also how is this going to work? We want to sum, we want to the grades, we want to take the grades to add up to i. So it should be how is this going to work? I it's i minus j. Okay. Okay. I think that's right. Yes. So just when you thought this couldn't get more complicated, it's going to get more complicated. So the next the next column. Okay, is this not good news or bad news? <laughs> uh, um, just sorry, just to clarify, there is a distinction between capital H home and lowercase h home. No. Oh, there isn't? No. I don't want to do, I don't want to make any distinction for the purposes of this talk. I don't want to do oh. that. So oh, that's, okay. just, right. that's just a mistake I've been making. Okay. I'll try to stick to lowercase. Yeah. If you're talking to a real category theorist, yeah, they make all kinds of distinctions, but yeah. Right. Okay, so the yeah, so we're going to just take graded vector spaces and now we're adding a boundary map between the grades. So now, so what are we calling this category of chain complexes over some field? So now our objects are graded vector spaces together with these boundary maps. And that if you do any two of these boundary maps together, you get zero. And I guess uh, if you haven't seen this before, uh, I'm just going to do try to do an example so that you don't have to worry too much about the general theory. And I and I guess I just I just have to say that uh, if you look at the literature 
this stuff is homological algebra. If you look at the literature on homological algebra the ma that the mathematicians do, they always, or very often they take, they don't do it over a field and take a ring here. And this mm -hmm. makes things so much more complicated. And so for a lot of what, what I'm interested in and what we do with quantum codes is we do this over a field. And um, it just means that if you go and read the standard reference on homological algebra, it's virtually impossible to understand anything. So this is kind of a hole in the literature, I think, that there's this simple case that we're interested in, but the mathematicians are just like, oh no, that's too simple. We're not interested in this. <laughs> So I have, I've actually had to learn a lot of this by actually talking to the experts about this stuff. It's, yeah. So anyway, let me just jump right into an example. Because um, this, this is just got a bit complicated. So I'm just going to take the field here is going to be the integers mod two. So let me, so let me just write it like that. It's just zero and one mod zero and two. And I'm going to just take a simple example of a, a repetition code. So that's just going to. So my two vectors, I'm going to just have two non-zero vector spaces, four dimensional vector space and a three dimensional vector space and everything else is going to be zeros. So that's my graded vector space. And I should just tell you what the grades are. So this is grade, that's grade minus one. This is grade zero. And I'm, yeah, I guess, it doesn't matter too much, but for my purposes, that's those are the grades that I'm choosing here. And because we're in this world of chain complexes, we need a boundary map. And the only one we're worried about is this guy because everything else is zero. And I'll write actually write down a matrix for this. It's just going to be a map from four guys to three. So it's going to look like that. And I'm just going to put in, this is a very simple code. Uh, it's a repetition code and it has a nice picture, which I like, I like to draw. So I'll draw the, these four guys as links. And the three, these three guys, I'll draw these as zero dimensional. So anyway, the dimensions, the dimensions of these guys do not match the grades. So that's the first confusing thing here. So I've drawn these as zero dimensional guys and the grade minus one is zero dimensions here and the grade zero is one dimensional here. So hopefully that doesn't get too confusing, but the reason why I drew this picture is I think of this repetition code as a simple icing model. And the, so how does this work? This is the kind of the dual of the, of the so, so the, the zero dimensional guys are the, these are the checks. So each one of these guys checks that the two, the spins are in agreement. So that a check is frustrated when the two adjacent spins are non, that don't agree with each other. So these are the spins here. And I guess, right, so I guess I'm, I'm thinking of this as a classical IC model. It's also just a repetition code. So I hope this is a reasonably familiar to people. So now what I want to think about is there, is, sorry, is, there, is there any significance to this interpretation as a Hamiltonian of a classical spin model? Right, I guess 
I didn't write down the Hamiltonian. Uh, how would the Hamiltonian work? Yeah, you could write down a Hamiltonian, but I, yeah, I, I like to I like to give this a kind of a energetic interpretation that the, that the uh, yeah right. So I should just write down. <laughs> uh, the ground space is like the kernel of this of this matrix. Okay, yeah, yeah that makes perfect sense. Thanks. Yeah. Kernel, which is going to be just look like this guy. So either all the spins are zero or they're all one. And then the checks are all happy. Does that make sense to everyone? You plug this vector matrix matrix vector multiply. Yeah, yeah. You get, you get zero. Okay. yeah, it does. Thank you. Okay. So, can anyone guess where this is going? <laughs> Quantum codes. Uh huh. So, what I'm gonna what I'm gonna do is think about uh, what the homes look like in this category, which I didn't I didn't tell you about yet. I guess I can put it over here. So home from home from a chain complex A to a chain complex B, it just looks like this. So you write out the, the two chain complexes, one on top of the um, one on top of the other. And then you're looking for maps. You're looking for maps, just like in the in the graded in this graded case, we're looking for maps to go from from each grade to the same grade, let's say, that actually commute with the boundary operators. So if you go around this way. You get the same map as if you're going around this way. That's just grade zero. That's the grade zero home. I don't. I don't know if I'll get to talking about the other, the other grades in this talk. But let's just think about the grade zero for now. And so I'm gonna let's try to do an example of, uh, for this code here. what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this one that we just looked at from four spins to three checks and I'm going to try to do a renormalization group trick so I want to map this down to something smaller and just about as small as possible actually so I'm going to just talk about is going to have two spins and one check. And so this matrix, can you write it again? And this one down here is just a very small, oh, just a very small. And we're looking for We're looking for two maps here and here that make this diagram commute. And this is kind of tricky. Let me let me try to draw the icing icing model picture. And and they have to be linear maps. Do they? That's right. They're linear maps. So this is hmm. going from four to two. So this guy looks like this. And this one is going from three to one. So I guess that's just that. And we need to fill in uh, so I guess the idea is that you're you're doing a linear map on the spins so you can make taking these four spins down to two spins such that if you do the check down the bottom is the same as 
you do the check up the top and then you map the checks down to here. Yeah. That's the kind of the idea behind this home. And you can kind of brute force this if you if you have it uh, it takes a yeah, you can actually just sit down and do linear algebra and work this out, like all the possible solutions here. But what I'm going to do is use what we've been talking about at the home from A to B is the same as the dual of this guy, tensor B. It's a matrix. So I'm going to draw a matrix for these for these homes. I'm going to keep, yeah, just trying to stick with the same matrix idea that I've been using in all these different categories. So how does this work? So down the bottom, yeah. so down the bottom we have this, The dual, the dual guy looks like this. There's something really confusing about the dimensions and the gradings, but that's 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 the dual IC model. And then the B guy we have is this guy. And now the tensor product. Looks something like this. They're actually uh, what I've got here is point times point, which gives you these four guys. Line times point, which gives you these three. Point times line gives you these four eight lines here. And this I'm supposed to be just using this formula here that that we from graded vector spaces. That's what I'm doing. But it has this nice pictorial interpretation. And there's also a, uh, a two dimensional or grade. Well, there are two dimensions, but they're grade one, actually, which is line times line. So let me just draw those in. They look like squares. And so what I'm thinking now is that this home here is a matrix. I'm thinking of this as a matrix representation of a map from A to B. And what I'm going to draw is, I'm just going to guess here, and I'm just going to draw this is supposed to be like, hopefully that, does that red show up okay? Yes, yeah, very well. Yeah. yeah. So this is supposed to be like a slope one half line, because mm -hmm. the idea is I'm renormalizing this icing chain to a smaller one. And so now I can take this line and I can fill in what's going on over here. If I get this right. Um, to just a curiosity. So this, this formula that you wrote on the upper left, uh, the, the, yeah, is this, uh, this is always true for these kind of chain complexes that you write down. Yeah, all a, a and B are any chain complex. Okay, so, so is, yeah. is there some kind of interpretation that, like, I don't know, every homological pro, uh, every homological code corresponds to a homological product or something like that? Yeah, I mean, for the experts, um, that this is what this is kind of the magical thing about this is that yeah. chain maps actually correspond to logical operators in some yeah. higher homological product code. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's what I'm doing here. Yeah. Yeah. In particular, this is always the case, right? This is not not, not, yes. not for specific codes. Okay. That's that's always it's weird. It's always yeah. it's always true. That's right. So I guess I could write down this is kind of the punchline of the talk, I guess. Oh sorry. <laughs> so. Yeah yeah. Chain so chain maps. Uh, what do we say the Logical operators. Mm. Homological. 
product count. Yeah. And I'll so I'll just try to finish this calculation here. Let's see what this looks like. <laughs> it's the best way of calculating. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I was just saying, yeah, that's the best way to calculate. Like people say finish calculations in right. uh, at least of the cases, it looks like this, but um, was... yeah. uh, <laughs> so good. So I'm kind of guessing here, but uh, these, so the, the four going to the two here, it's, it's these horizontal links here. So I think the answer, the answer that you get looks like this for that and just keep the dots being zero. And then the vertical links here end up over here. And if you do this matrix multiplication, uh, how's the time going by the way? All right. Yeah, if you actually do this matrix multiplication, it does, you actually do get the right answer. Uh, and then you can, uh, you can look, looking at this guy, I mean, there's other, there's other logical operators here, right? We could just take a vertical string operator and that corresponds to like moving these, moving these ones around. And then we just change these as well over here. And so that so those are all right. You can also check that the that the kernel, these string operators send the the kernel of the A code to the kernel of the B code. So that corresponds to a non-trivial logical operator. Because the, of course there's also all kinds of trivial logical operators, and those kill the uh, the kernel of the A code. So I guess, uh, so today, right, I just focused on this one example of working with this category of chain complexes. There's so much more stuff, uh, right? So, I mean, I did a simple kind of renormalization group example here, and this is maybe this is a, the kind of thing that people do for decoding that, that um, in the literature you, you think of, right? So in the literature, this would be like the Tory code and this is like half a size Tory code. And then this is some four dimensional Tory code here. And so, yeah, so this is something, this is the kind, like, I find there's a lot of examples in the literature that secretly there are these chain comp chain maps floating around. Um, so part of what I wanted to just talk about today is that, yeah, there is all this machinery kind of lurking behind the scenes and maybe in, in the coding theory community, people are not so interested in this abstract stuff, but for me personally, I find it's like very useful. So I might just, Finish there. But, no. cool. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks. Um, that was really in, very insightful. Um, it's a nice um, high level picture. So we had lots of questions along the way. Um, maybe there's more. Uh, yeah. yeah I got... Oh, you go first. Oh, oh hi, Simon. Uh, thanks for the nice uh, talk. Yoshka. <laughs> 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 um, so yeah, for the hypergraph products, um, we have some quite nice relations that relate the minimum distance of the code to the initial um, original chain complexes, right? So the minimum distance is uh, lower bounded by the distances of the original chain complex and its transpose. Um, and I guess I wanted to ask whether these uh, chain maps or can, the, can those relations be derived directly from these chain maps? And if this is, works more generally, that would be very useful because in some of the more um, recent product constructions um, from Pantelava et al, um, we found that 
some of these concrete relations that relate the distance of the classical codes to the resultant quantum codes don't really hold. Mm -hmm. But if there was a systematic way of computing the minimum distance from the property of the chain complex, it might be interesting to see whether it works in that setting. I guess. Uh, so one thing that's going on here is that uh, when we talk about codes, it's always very explicitly uh, there's a basis for your for your vector spaces, uh, and so when you talk about distance, it's always with respect to some basis. So this is a kind of a extra structure on this category. Uh, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I mean, the the bear. So what am I trying to say? I guess the bear category of chain complexes is is there's no basis, there's no preferred basis, and so the ideas of distance don't survive just in this in this bear category. So it's actually a lot more work to think about how, how how to do this kind of stuff when there are when there are these bases floating around mm. yeah so would this relate to a, sort of incorporating a way of locality in these um, in these uh, individual vector spaces because that's basically what you have if you have a hypograph product you have a notion of neighborhood um, absolutely which yeah. then gives rise to this preferred basis yeah yeah yeah, exactly. exactly. I, mean, I mean, on the previous page, you had this uh, grading formula that, like, if you had the graded object from the, like, yeah, exactly that one. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I remember in, in Nico's talk, I think at some point, oh no, I think it was Pavel Pantelev's talk at some point, like, like they, they, they basically, I mean, showed that, like, the, the logical operators of the, like, tensor product code relates to the logical operators of the underlying codes. Right. So, so out of that and the vector space properties, you, you should be able to. I mean, so the Bravi hates not as not as concretely. Like, I mean, there's no way of from the base code. There isn't a way a systematic way of computing. It is just. From, I mean, you can show that it, if the underlying code has certain yeah. expansion properties. No, no. I mean, the the Bravi the, the proof uh, for the just for the bound for the minimum. The, the, there's a lower and and the, there's a lower and, and the upper bound from the Bravi Hastings paper, which really just comes out of the vectorization property that, that you can apply to the tensor product. And so, but, uh, so, 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 I mean, this, this directly comes out of this formula, basically. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So this, this, this is how you can compute minimal distances. I mean, you can always talk about the minimum distance of like a homology operator, right? And then the homology operator will be composed of the kernel and the image of the boundary maps associated with the quantum code. And those would encode the structure of your classical codes. Okay. So Is that just the same as like still exhaustive research? No, 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 not really. Uh, How do you know that there exists no? I mean, as far as I understand this argument, uh, you say, okay, the logical operator of one base code sort of carries over to a logical operator. In no, the, no, 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 there's, in no, there's, the, there's, no, no there's, no, there's no logical operator for a classical code. A classical code, like Simon showed, is a short exact sequence. So in a short exact sequence, you have trivial logical operators because you have maps on either side to uh, zero. But uh, in a quantum code, a quantum code is a total complex of two classical codes. And the boundary maps are defined from the boundary operators of two classical codes. Yes, he yes. knows that. Yeah. Um, no, no, no. No, but, no, 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 no. But, but, but the point is that you want to compute want the to distance of a code, right? And you compute it from the okay, homology. Sorry, groups. sorry. Um, okay. It's not the logical operator of the base code. It's the code word of the base code carries over to be a logical operator in the quantum code. So, yeah, and yeah, this gives true. an upper bound to the minimum distance because, I mean, okay, you found one logical operator. So mm -hmm. in the minimum distance is um, maximum of that way. But 
And as far as I understood your argument, this is no. You can also you are upper bound. You so it's, it's an upper bound for the distance, right? Because it's an no, no. But yeah, but in, 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 in similar in similar ways, yeah. you can also construct lower bounds. Oh really? Yeah, I mean, but how do you get this? Because I mean, you don't explicitly code, like you don't explicitly construct. I mean, what you said is okay. I take a, I have this tensor product construction. I take what I take the logical operator from one or state from one and I take code word from from the other I tensor them together and then hey this is just one thing and this gives you the upper bound right yeah. so the, the upper bound is just like distance of the first thing times distance of the second thing something like that yeah. and but like you can use the same same okay. tensor yeah, okay. product property right not the same argument but yeah, you, yeah, can, but you can use the same property to <laughs> oh that's strange I because i always to, thought that getting, trying to getting lower bounds is really related to what you, you said like an exhaustive you have to somehow like bound the yeah, bound but the way the second yeah. code acts I mean, on the code words i mean to, for like, products this upper bound is also a lower bound uh, <laughs> okay but yeah if you so i don't know about the hastings heartbreak but in the lifted product then it's only in upper bound yeah it's just the same so the lifted product is very similar to hypergram product just mm -hmm. with a different underlying algebra but things get scrambled um yeah. i think in the hastings half paper it was done in a different way for these extra twist codes but i think still there the distance was only proven with high probability right but, but is this um is this a, I mean, um, an isomorphism between the two products yeah i mean basically they're related, yes. I mean, like, like the, uh, like I don't know the if simpli simplific simplification of the Bravi Hastings argument is that I mean, basically, if you if you take a logical operator of the tensor product code, then must act non-trivially somewhere on at least one of the base codes. E right. yeah. Well, it's these extra twists. If you look at the if you look at those codes with a service code, for example, and you modify the boundary conditions. Although, yes, then you have different C emergencies. Uh, okay, well, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, you, you should look at the Bravi Hastings book. I mean, like, that's that's really the thing. If you have a logic operator of the whole thing, then, has, then it has to act non logically non trivial somewhere on some of the base code from which you can directly using vectorization, which which is what. what I mean, yeah, Simon that, does, that doesn't mean that there can't be some other combination of. No, no, but, but operators and stabilizers and the resultant quantum code that has lower distance. But this is yeah, just because no, 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 no codes, but it, no, this is this is how you derive this the lower bound on, on the distance of the higher thing because it has to act non-trivially somewhere. So it has to at least yeah, but yes, there are some like sense if in you, the like product if you that want a logical operator of that of that length, right? But then yeah, but logical uh, operator multiplied by any stabilizer could it could be longer. Right, but this is a or shorter. But that's yeah, one but thing about yeah <laughs> about minimum distance yeah. you have to rule out. So yeah, it doesn't lower about but it doesn't guarantee a lower bound. But yeah, I, I don't really know. I mean maybe there is some detail in the, yeah, the product construction I like then it's anyway. Yeah, that would confuse me. But yeah, yeah, sorry, Sam. <laughs> Can I change topic completely? Please. <laughs> oh, okay. Cool. Uh, um, I, I, I just, I was, just think I missed it, but what is the unit for the graded and chained vector spaces? Is it just all yep. the underlying field repeated? It's the equivalent to, no. Uh, how do you draw this? It's just the base field at grade zero and zero everywhere else. Including in the chain, chain complex? Yeah, it's the same. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. I get it. I see. Yeah. But doesn't it, it doesn't seem like, surely there's another construction that has some similar properties to a unit under the tensor product. It doesn't seem like it's unique to me, but I guess I haven't really thought about it.
that that was that was the end of the question. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Great. So you said, uh, Simon, that you uh, could use this for decoding, that um, if you go to your, I mean, not your third slide, but your third piece of paper. Yeah, 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 yeah. right. <laughs> so just to see that um, I understood correctly. So A star as well as B are individual, like uh, for, if you want to decode a quantum code, each of them are, a quantum code, right? So length three. Uh, yeah, S yeah. Uh -huh. B as well, or yeah, yeah. Okay, so okay, interesting. So yeah, then the matrix would be this, like I would, like the surface code is a is an example. Yeah, yeah. Could have, yeah. But this example didn't matrix. get. I mean, you have like the surface code and in, in one axis, like and half the code uh, on the other. Can, can you explain this example a bit better? Well, yeah, I mean, you would have like a th three by three surface code and then a two by two surface code. And then the product would be a four dimensional. Ah, okay, I see, yeah, yeah, okay. And so how would then this matrix going from K4 to K2, for example, like this matrix, um, yeah, right, so the arrow pointing down onto your finger. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so this matrix corresponds to this red line. Um, yeah, uh, it corresponds to- Can one read to... off a sort of a recovery operation or what? Because in decoding, I mean, you in the end want to have sort of at least want to, yeah, probabilities assigned to some recovery operations. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like so how it's kind of a- state Out of from this string of red links or matrix that the string corresponds to. Yeah, uh, it's, I mean, there you kind of go out of the realm of linear algebra, right? It's much, yeah, yeah. it's kind of nasty. Yeah. But this is the general idea behind the renormalization group decoders in the literature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even though they don't talk about chain maps there. And this, I mean, this yeah, is just I one, see, yeah, yeah. this is just I mean, one example. Sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, they in this RG, yeah, I see that they map like large codes to smaller and smaller codes in a yeah. in a um, homomorphous way. Let's put it that way. Um, yeah. Uh, but yes. It, yeah. yeah. So another another thing that you can do once. Uh, it's kind of more category theory and machinery is that you you can start thinking about welding codes together and so those are those are called uh, those are called um, codings and so this is kind of a way of just taking two codes and like gluing them gluing them together mm. so so that also works with in terms of chain maps and and all, all of this machinery, you write down the chain maps and you just do very general constructions on those. Okay. There's so many applications for this stuff. Uh, I think it's a lot of oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so does it? Uh, I mean, you can also encapsulate non-CSS codes in terms of chain complex, right? Um, uh, that's a good question. And I think with this stuff, no, like you have to stick to CSS codes. I don't know how to do this with more general codes. Yes, you can write down a chain complex for more general codes, but the, the, the chain maps, um, it's this symplectic geometry, which it's a total, it's a totally different animal. I think. Okay, so you I can't know. just introduce a second layer of grading, which corresponds to like this X and Z part, and then, as you said, this symplectic structure on this Z2 type grading. I mean, you want homological algebra, you want Bell squared to somehow relate X stabilizers with Z stabilized, or at least everything that things that do not compare with each other. 
somehow. Mm, yeah, but I mean, that's not, um, that's not the yeah. main problem, I think, in the construction, because you can just imagine having sort of double the size of the matrix and then related yeah. different blocks to each other. Like, this is not the yeah. problem. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah, you can. I mean, this is what John Wan Ha does in some of his work. He writes down a, a, a length to chain complex, and this is like, um, this is, uh, this is so, like the same. Yeah, there's like a boundary, but this guy over here is like the symplectic transpose of the boundary map. I, I forget how it works. Um, so I think it's like the places upon which you act with poly operators and then the positions upon where you create excitations analogously. Yeah, but, but like when you start mapping these, when you start applying chain maps to these, you destroy this symplectic structure. So okay. I, I think it's a totally different animal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So you would need some more structure, and then it would not be category of chain complexes anymore. It would yeah, be I don't think so. Some, yeah. some extended thing. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, do the boxes in your diagram have any meaning? They're like going to be oh, some kind I'm of so matrix. Glad you asked. I'm so glad you asked. So. Yeah, so there are there are degree one guys over here. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. So this is I was just talking about the degree zero of the home, but the degree one of the home, those are those are homotopies, I, I believe. So yeah, as you you can move this logical operator around modulo stabilizers, so that is a homotopy, and that's that information comes with these higher, these other grades. It's, it's actually, I mean, it's amazingly complicated. I, I, I'm just so amazed that this stuff actually works. I don't think I can reproduce a concrete calculation right now, but, but yeah, that's the idea. I see. Yeah. Uh, Simon, can I ask a slightly more basic question? So yep. if you look at it horizontally, you said that the map from K4 to K3 is a short exact sequence because you this have is not a short no it's just a uh, ch chain map like a short exact uh, exact sequences have trivial homology so this doesn't have trivial homology but but you uh, drew zeros on either side on your previous page right uh, yeah, when you're yeah. talking about the grading oh. yeah so right yeah so it's not exact here because this there's a kernel here. And I think so what happens here? Uh, the kernel is the whole space, and I think the image. So I think it might be exact at this spot here. So there's no yeah. kernel yeah. here, but there is a kernel here, so it's not exact here. Yeah, 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 but like the, I mean, like if you take the whole sequence, then you'll have like trivial operators, right? Yeah. Um, yep. From K3 and, okay, yeah. So my, my question was, um, if you have a short exact sequence from K4 to K3 and from K2 to K1, uh, like if you extend those out, yeah, if you add like zeros, like on either sides of those. Up here? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, then will there also be like an exact sequence from K4 to K2, like vertically? Oh, right. So you're wondering about this thing here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's that? Okay, that's a good question. Yeah, you're thinking of this guy as a code. Yeah. What is that code? Yeah, interesting. I don't know. It's a cool question. This is the kind of games that homological algebra people play, right? They draw these diagrams and then they start, what if I go around here? <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Have you um, thought about like some of the more advanced machinery of um, homological algebra? Uh, like for instance, like spectral sequences. 
it totally blows my brain. I just cannot, I, I, I just, very, very little. I thought a little bit about it, but I need to talk to a mathematician and have them explain it to me because I yeah. cannot read the literature. It's so complicated. It, yeah. it, is, it is very interesting though, yeah. Have you? Yeah. Uh, yeah, um, I was actually working with it for uh, some time. Uh, I was uh, trying to uh, re-express uh, logical operators uh, in terms of like spectral sequences. And I still think there is some scope for it, uh, but cool. like the problem is like if you operate over a field, like, I don't know, like uh, a trivial field and there really isn't much use or scope for applying some of these more advanced techniques is there. What yeah. is it? Real field. Like F2 on um, basic. Uh, like, uh, yeah, but in this case, so there's no. So, so, so you're no, saying no, that no. using short sec, uh, these, these things for qubit codes is useless? I wouldn't say it's useless, but I, I didn't see like right. any instance where all that power could be used. So, what do spectral sequences? Um, uh, they're, basically, they're basically an approximation sequence for homology and cohomology groups of total complexes. So when you have a total complex, yeah. you always condense it down into like a one-dimensional complex. But when you do this- You um, lose exactness. Um, no, 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 that's not the point. It's not that you lose exactness, it's that you lose some information, which may not be captured by the boundary maps. And in order to get the homology and cohomology groups to converge, you sometimes need to use uh, like these spectral sequences. So you converge basically to like a homology or a cohomology group. Okay, and the spectral is related to? Uh, uh, I think it's just a name. Uh, okay. This is name. Uh, okay. Uh, but no, that isn't. Okay. Uh, no, but like, yeah, I, I was interested if you'd uh, like thought some more about this um, uh, in the context of like coding theory. Um, because I mean, like there are all these relationships with um, between quantum codes and things like the Kuhn formula, for instance. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, like in general, um, for uh, chain complexes, like it's not always guaranteed whether something like the Kuhn formula would be satisfied. Yeah. Uh, so, like for instance, if you work over K theory, then there is like I think like in mild instances of like complex K theory, there is like breakages of the Kunis formula. Uh huh. And uh, yeah, it, it would be yeah, it would be interesting to see if you you can have like if you had a breakage of the Kunis formula in this sort of framework, like what would it correspond to on the level of logical operators for quantum codes? I mean, a lot a lot of what you're talking about is what I was saying before about as soon as you're doing this stuff over a field, like a lot of this machinery just becomes trivial. Yeah. 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 I think that's what you're saying as well. Yeah. So yeah. sorry. So what what is your name? I uh, uh, it shows up. Um, we follow each other on Twitter though. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, did you catch my name or no? Uh, shows up. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> cool name. Found another person interested. Oh, but you found a, a, another friend of chain complexes, right? Yeah. <laughs> Just a, a connoisseur. How do you say? Wonderful. Wonderful. Um. So, is there a last question of some sort? That was really good. That was very insightful. Also